Welcome to Supervision. Uh, my name is Robert and I am a licensed professional counselor supervisor here in the state of Texas. And if you are watching this, then more than likely you are one of my associates that I'm supervising and I have asked you to watch this. We will, of course, be covering these topics along with many others in our group session and individual counseling supervision sessions uh, as you are working with me. Uh, today, on this one, we're looking at a really important topic of reporting abuse, and we're going to be discussing the Texas Family Code a little bit in detail. And so, uh, I hate to say this, but uh, this one's going to be a little bit dull. Uh, some of this topic and material you already know and uh, have been exposed to, but there are some little aspects that we need to make sure are clear. If you have any questions, then definitely contact me uh, individually and we can go through this, okay? Uh, so welcome again to supervision. And if you are not one of my supervisees, then hopefully this will help you uh, learn more about the industry. As I've said in other uh, episodes, uh, I have demonetized these. I do not make anything from them. This is strictly for the purposes of improving uh, the profession, the industry, helping counselors become better at what they do as LPCs, and uh, yeah, that's about it. So as we get going, just follow along. This one might be a little bit lengthy. Okay, I'm going to be doing each of these uh, auditory only, and so we're looking at the Texas Family Code in this one. You can find that online. Uh, there is the website. Uh, otherwise, you can just Google it. You can type into Google uh, search engine that you are looking for Texas Family Code. Uh, we're going to go into more detail on it in a moment, but you feel free to write that down if you so choose. Okay, so here we will see Family Code, Title V, the parent-child relationship and the suit affecting the parent-child relationship. Subtitle E, protection of the child. That's really what this section is about. Uh, chapter 261, investigation of report of child abuse or neglect, purpose of this video. Uh, Subchapter A, general provisions. What you're going to find here is really definitions, explanations, that kind of thing. There's going to be a definition here of abuse. You see that in line one. Includes the following acts or omissions by a person. Kind of goes into some detail. Uh, read through this. Go online uh, and, and just get used to the wording and, and how it's expressed. I think some important qualities here that we really need to look at would be under item D. Failure to make a reasonable effort to prevent an action by another person that results in physical injury that re results in substantial harm to the child. I think the key element here is that aspect of reasonable effort. Uh, let's you know just kind of be candid about this. Uh, common sense is no longer common, and so we have to go with reasonable, and that would be determined by a jury of peers. So, if you are an LPC associate or an LPC or any other mental health care provider or health care provider in general, we have to have a reasonable level of understanding. That does not mean your job is to investigate, but if you run across what appears to be abuse as defined in A, B, C, of this category, then you're expected to make a report. We're going to go into more detail on that. Uh, I think it's also important that we look down at a few of these other ones. Uh, letter G, compelling or encouraging the child to engage in sexual conduct uh, as defined by section 43.01 penal code, uh, including compelling or encouraging the child uh, in a manner that constitutes an offense of trafficking. Uh, right now in the state of Texas, uh, you will have to have your experience uh, continuing education class on human trafficking if you want to get your full license. I believe they require it for you to get your associate's level as well. 
So you want to be aware of that. It is a part of it. If you run across this, you have to report it to Child Protective Services. Uh, also notice under H and I uh, aspects of pornography. And this is a huge area with kids right now. If you find out that there is what's called uh, sex extortion, and it's where other kids or adults are getting kids to send pictures of themselves that are in a naked sense, pornographic. The kid is then coerced into sending more. Otherwise, they will be reported to parents or somebody else. So these kids are finding themselves being extorted, or a new word, sextorted, into forcibly providing images, video, etc., of themselves, either in naked conditions or in all-on sexual activity. That needs to be reported, uh, and you have to do it. Uh, so uh, and there at the bottom, under category M, forcing or coercing a child to enter into marriage, you'll find the word exploitation under number three. Uh, exploitation means the illegal or improper use of a child or of the resource of a child for monetary or personal benefit, profit, or gain by an employee, volunteer, or other individual working under the auspices of a facility or program as further described by rule or policy. So that's kind of a fancy way of saying a kid's being taken advantage of, okay? Uh, those need to be reported as well. There are really strict labor laws as well as abuse laws on the family code as well as the Texas penal code. You need to become aware of that. So here we are in the next section. Uh, you'll notice at the very top, when you're looking through the family code, uh, the text of subdivisions here was an amendment uh, made last year in 2021 by the 87th legislation uh, under House Bill 2536. Uh, the category of neglect, um, here we've got some, some very detailed qualities to the family code uh, of what neglect is defined as. Uh, leaving of a child in a situation, uh, exposing them to the risk of physical or mental harm, uh, not demonstrating intent to be returned. So if a parent leaves and doesn't show they're going to be back at a date and time, they're just abandoning the kid, that would be a form of neglect. Um, also, placing them in just general situations that, that could lead to their injury, both bodily but emotionally. Now, as you're going through this, read over it, take a moment. You can pause this and read through it. It's a good idea to do that. Uh, we also have to recognize that the uh, qualities here are kind of detailed, and you do need to become uh, familiar with them, OK? Continue reading into the Texas Family Code, we find uh, here again, under the same legislation as previously, the 87th legislation meeting here in Texas of last year, that House Bill 567 changed this section of the definition of neglect, uh, meaning that an act of failure to act by a person responsible for a child's care, custody, or welfare, evidencing the person's blatant disregard for the consequences or the act, or the failure to act, that result in harm to the child, or that creates an immediate danger to the child's physical health or safety. And, that's an important component there, at and includes what you're about to have to go into and read there. Here again, pause and read through this. It's important to have an idea of what all is in there, so that you can explain it to your parents, that you may be working with, you can explain it to other individuals, what neglect is. Also identifying who exactly is in responsibility. Uh, if you go down towards the bottom there, number five has some letters that identify who all is exactly responsible. Persons responsible for a child's care, custody, or welfare means a person who traditionally is responsible for a child's care, custody, or welfare includes A, the parent, guardian, managing or possessory conservatorship, 
foster parent. Those are important aspects. You will run into each of those in the hospital settings as well as in private practice settings. B, a member of the child's family or household as defined by Chapter 71. Uh, that category was implemented because uh, the definition of family has so wide a range now that it, uh, family is not always blood related. So if there's someone living in your home, even though uh, they may uh, be not blood related, but you consider them family, then they are family. And by that definition, it is also their responsibility to be a part of that child's well-being. Uh, C, a person with whom the child's parent cohabits. That would be that one. D, school personnel or a volunteer at the child's school. Um, e, personnel or a volunteer at a public or private child care facility that provides services for the child or at a public or private residential institution or facility where the child resides. So this is the one that actually falls under our category as LPCs and LPC associates. If you are working in a healthcare facility, be it a psychiatric hospital, an outpatient program, a regular medical hospital that is employing you, uh, or in private practice setting, we fall under that category right there where you are providing a service for the child. So we're under that category as well. We're also listed in other areas in the family code, specifically identifying us. And so now we have arrived at subchapter B, report of abuse or neglect uh, and immunities. So this one here is important enough that I'm gonna just read to you what it says as opposed to just letting you read it for yourself because this is the one that really hits us in uh, the ballpark. So section 261.101, persons required to report and time of report. A, a person having reasonable cause to believe that a child's physical or mental health or welfare has been adversely affected by abuse or neglect by a person shall immediately make a report as provided by this chapter. Okay, so here again, the word reasonable is in play. If you have a reason to suspect, then you have a reason to report. B, if a professional, that would be you as the LPC associate, has reasonable cause to believe that a child has been abused or neglected or may be abused or neglected or that a child is a victim of an offense under section 21.11 Texas Penal Code and the professional has reasonable cause to believe that the child has been abused as defined by section 261.001 the professional shall make a report not later than 48th hour after the hour the professional first has reasonable cause to believe that the child has been or may be abused or neglected or is a victim of an offense under section 21.11 penal code. A professional may not delegate to or rely on another person to make the report. In this subsection, professional means an individual who is licensed or certified by the state or who is an employee of a facility licensed certified or operated by the state and who, in the normal course of official duties or duties for which a license or certification is required, has direct contact with the child or with children. Uh, the term includes teachers, nurses, doctors, daycare employees, employees of a clinic or healthcare facility. There you are, that's us. Uh, that provides reproductive services, juvenile probation services and officers, Juvenile detention and correctional officers are also included here. Okay, so let's pause for a moment and take into account there's some qualities to this that we need to be aware of. Um, there's a time period noted there, 48 hours. Uh, so that would be two days from the moment you become aware and suspect using a reasonable aspect of uh, assumption. Now, some employment locations, some facilities and hospitals and organizations have a 
24-hour policy uh, that you have to report to CPS as well as to your immediate supervisors. I'm going to actually say that that is an excellent approach to take. And the reason for that is if you suspect it at all, yes, I would highly encourage you to talk to your immediate supervisor at your facilities, but then also contact me, your LPC supervisor, or, and if you don't have, if you're not with me, then you contact your LPC supervisor directly. But you, you have up to 48 hours to report by state standard and written law. However, you don't have to have proof, you just need to have reasonable cause. Okay, this is an important component. Go ahead and make that call. Let your employer know what you're doing and that it, uh, you are responsible to do it. You cannot delegate it. I think that's the other aspect here I really want to kind of drive home. You can't hand this off to someone else. You are the one that has to call and give them the information. And we'll cover that uh, in detail in just a moment. So, let's talk for a moment about false reporting and the criminal penalty or civil penalty of giving a false report. Uh, first of all, you would have to fall under some categories here of knowingly making a false report. Um, because under the previous heading we looked at, uh, it says that there was reasonable cause. You do not have to investigate. In fact, it's highly discouraged to go in and do your own investigation. But all you need to do is have enough material to say, I think something is really going on here. However, notice here, part A, a person commits an offense if, when the intent to deceive person knowingly makes a report as provided in this chapter that is false. An offense under this subsection is a state jail felony unless it is shown on the trial of the offense that the person has previously been convicted under the section, in which case the offense is a felony of a third degree. Uh, guys, gentlemen, ladies, all I can say is this. Uh, if you're doing it for the purposes of deception and hurting someone, even if you think it's going to make help in the long run, if it is deceptive, then just don't do it. Um, the penalties are pretty harsh. Uh, you'll notice there under uh, letter E, any person who engages in conduct described by this subsection is liable to the state for a civil penalty of $1,000. The Attorney General shall bring in a action to recover civil penalty authorized by this subsection. Also, if that happens, there is always going to be the possibility that the Behavioral Executive Committee will call you in to answer. And if that happens, then there's always the chance your license could be at stake. You want to be cautious. Here again, it's about intentional deception where all you need is reasonable cause. So, just be honest. Now then, this here on failure to report is what will probably get you in the most trouble. Um, notice, remembering, we have a time period to report our suspicions, our reasonable cause, and the penalty for a failure to report uh, is if we commit an offense, if the person is required to make a report, which we are, knowingly fails to make a report provided in this chapter. Uh, A1, a person who is a professional, that would be us, as defined by the section previously discussed, commits an offense if the person is required to make a report, which we are, and knowingly fails to make that report. Guys, don't do it. Make the report. Even if you are told by someone else, no, you don't have to, I'll do it for you. Or if you have a supervisor or someone from your employment say, oh, no, don't do that. Um, no, you have to do it, guys. Okay, that, that's just all there is to it. I don't care who's telling you you don't have to. The state of Texas says you do. 
okay? And if anybody gets in your face about that, direct them to me and I'll direct them to the Texas Family Code and the Texas Penal Code and they can take that up with the state of Texas, okay? So, okay, here's where things get a little bit different. Uh, section B, an offense under subsection A is a class A misdemeanor, except that the offense is a state jail felony. Okay, so that, that may be a little confusing. Uh, if it is shown on the trial of the offense that the child was a person with an intellectual disability who reside, resided in a state-supported living center. So, okay, here's where we classify that one there. Um, if the individual is special needs and they're in a state-run facility, at that point in time, the misdemeanor becomes a felony. That's all it means. So, in this case, yours would fall under 1A, Class A misdemeanor, okay, unless it's otherwise identified. So, uh, there again, a Class A misdemeanor, that has a harsh penalty. I am not going to tell you what it is because I'm going to suggest that you look it up for yourself. A Texas State Class A misdemeanor is not something to mess with. A Class C misdemeanor is not a big deal. It's usually just a bit of a fine. But a Class A, that has some bite to it. Okay, so we've looked at the Texas Family Code and it brought up a little bit of aspects of the Texas Penal Code. Let's take a few minutes and look at some signs of abuse. Here again, we have a uh, website URL, www.dfps.state.tex.us slash child underscore protection slash child underscore state safety slash recognize underscore abuse dot ASP. Yes, I just said that. Okay, so suspected physical abuse. Uh, you'll know it when you see it. Well, what is it going to look like? We're going to see frequent injuries, bruises, cuts, black eyes, possibly burns without adequate explanation. If they're perfect circles, that's probably a cigarette. Uh, frequent complaints of pain without injury. You don't see anything, but they're complaining. Uh, burns, bruises, unusual patterns. Uh, oftentimes, people do uh, heat up other things. I have seen uh, very bizarre shapes from taking paper clips and bending them and then using a cigarette lighter to heat them up. Uh, also, the child has a lack of reaction to pain. They've been over-sensitized. They've been overly come aware and conscious of pain. So that pain no longer is painful to them. That is one of the saddest things I think I have ever seen. Uh, also, if a child is aggressive, disruptive, uh, and destructive behavior, more so than just your average ADHD kind of scenario. Uh, additionally, on the flip side, passive, withdrawn, emotionless, uh, just flat in the affect, like nothing really bothers them anymore. Uh, fear of going home or fear of being around their parents. Injuries that appear after a child has not been seen for several days. So if you're seeing your client uh, who is a child in a private practice setting and you see them once a week uh, and you all of a sudden start seeing new issues, uh, then you have to ask that. Uh, I, for example, have had uh, a couple of different cases where the child minor was involved in some sporting events and they did get some injuries between sessions. And I would ask them, hey, how'd you get that? They would tell me it was from baseball or the Pee Wee Football League or whatever. Um, okay, it's plausible. I would verify that with mom and dad. And as long as there wasn't a whole lot of new ones, I kind of let it go. It wasn't a reasonable cause because they had a good enough explanation to it. Um, Another one there is unreasonable clothing that may hide injuries to arms or legs. Let's face it, in the state of Texas, summertime is extremely hot. If you've got a, uh, an adolescent or a child coming into your sessions 
and they are covered head to toe, like it was January or February, uh, you're going to want to really ask, why are you dressed so heavily? Uh, why are they covered from head to toe? So what exactly is neglect? Well, neglect is, as we read here, a failure to provide for a child's basic needs necessary to sustaining life and health. Failure also causes primarily by financial inability unless relief services have been offered and then refused. That, I think, is the real key there. Is the family refusing the help? So what you will see, um, obvious malnutrition. Uh, they just look like they're wasting away. Now, in the more severe cases, uh, belly bloat would happen. You rarely, rarely see this one in the United States. Uh, we see it on TV all the time of other countries, but in the US, you can find it, but it is exceedingly rare. Uh, I personally have only seen one case of that level uh, in 17 years. Uh, then, of course, we've got lack of personal cleanliness, uh, torn or dirty clothing, stealing or begging for food. Uh, I, sad to say, I have seen these three quite a bit. Uh, also, child unattended for long periods of time. Uh, in the past, I had to report a family that lived next to me, and because their children being left alone for extended periods of time, um, now, another aspect here, needing for glasses, dental care, or other medical attention, um, we have the ability to make referrals and send people to the doctor. We can say, hey, look, I think your child needs to see this. They need to get this taken care of. Um, I did that just the other day, and I thought it was uh, an appropriate referral from what I saw happening. We'll see uh, if that actually comes through. Also, uh, with regards to school, as the school year is about to get started again, frequent tardiness or absenteeism from school. Uh, this is a big component of neglect uh, because the parents aren't paying attention to getting them to school on time or in a timely manner. Uh, the next part there on sexual abuse, that was actually meant to be cut out, and I missed it. So we're going to cover that one next. Okay, here we are with the sexual abuse slide. Um, the, the areas that are included in this are uh, kind of diverse. Uh, sexual abuse includes fondling, touching a uh, child's privates, genitals, penetration. I want to point out that penetration does not have to be with fingers. It can be with any object. Uh, there's also incest, rape, sodomy. Indecent exposure, just flashing or exposing them or yourself uh, or the other adult to them, that would be considered an indecent exposure. And exploitation, that would be through uh, forcing them into prostitution or producing pornographic material. Here again, that's where the idea of sextortion comes into play. Uh, and the individuals that are forcing kids to do this, they themselves may be peers in school, and they may also be minors. That would get them in trouble uh, for sexual abuse, and the Texas uh, criminal codes are kind of severe with regards to that, because that would force the sex sorcerer, the one coercing them to do that, into uh, becoming a registered sex offender. They have no choice at that point. If they're convicted of it, they have to register. Okay, uh, let's move into what is it you're going to see? How are they going to present? You're going to find physical signs of sexually transmitted diseases are possible. Um, evidence of injury to the genital area. Uh, now, as an LPC associate, you should not be looking at their genitals at any time. So if they make a report to you that they are injured there, they hurt there, then by all means, report that to your nursing staff at the hospital. Uh, follow up with, uh, you can ask them questions, but that would be about it. You do not get to look. Okay, uh, if a young girl is pregnant, now from personal experience, I have uh, 
seen the youngest female that I've ever worked with pregnant at the age of eight. Yes, I said eight, single digit, eight years old. The father was 14, um, but it does happen. And so, of course, that did have to get reported. Uh, also noticing difficulty in sitting or walking. Uh, sexual contact with a child is extremely damaging uh, for obvious reasons of size. They're just not capable of accepting that at their size and age. Uh, additionally, extreme fear of being alone with adults of a certain sex. So if the perpetrator is male and the victim is female, she may have a hard time being around male adults. Additionally, if the perpetrator is female and the child has a real fear of being around other women, if she is also female, then you want to pay attention to that. Uh, that would come across uh, to you as the associate that the child is fearful of you just because of your gender. Okay, uh, if they're making sexual comments, behaviors, or sex play, uh, kids that are uh, sexualized at a young age will, they just, like it says in the next line, they have knowledge way beyond their years. Uh, they make comments about things that they should not know about. Uh, I've had kids comment to me about things that, frankly, a 9 or 10 year old should never know their word choice, their terminology, their vocabulary, and how they express themselves, it changes. Um, also, there's a possibility of them turning around and victimizing other children. Uh, most studies have shown that uh, sex perpetrators have a 75% chance, between 70 and 75, depending on which study you read, of being themselves perpetrated upon. So in other words, many perpetrators are themselves victims first. So now we're into emotional abuse. Emotional abuse is uh, the mental or emotional injury that results in an observable material impairment of a child's growth, development, or psychological functioning. Uh, it includes extreme forms of punishment, such as confining a child to a dark closet, habitual scapegoating, belittling, or rejecting uh, treatment for a child. So emotional abuse is one of those kind you won't see the scars, but what you will see is overcompliance. If the child is extremely compliant, more so than you would expect, um, you know, some kids want to please their parents, and some kids are just beat down into it. Uh, also, a low self-esteem, uh, just a absolutely amazingly horrible, I'm using some very difficult terminology here, but they have, in many cases from what I have worked with, this low self-esteem to the point where the dirt is above them, better than them. Uh, they, it's amazing how, how they can get beat down. Also, severe forms of depression, anxiety, and aggression. Uh, I want to point out that uh, in a future uh, video, I'll be talking about major depressive disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, and how anger and aggression, all three of those play hand in hand. And you will see that a lot with kids, especially if there's been abuse and emotional abuse. Uh, difficulty making friends, uh, lagging in physical and emotional development, intellectual development. Uh, a caregiver who belittles the child, withholds loves, and seems unconcerned about the child's problems. Uh, I hate to say it right now, but I do believe that that is one of our cultural dilemmas that we're working on in our country right now, is a lot of folks just not having enough concern for the welfare of other people. And we are about to wrap up this episode. So if you go to the website where you just type in Texas Department of Family and Protective Services, or you go to a Google search and just type in CPS reporting, this is more in line with what you're going to find. The phone number, 1-800-252-5400. 
I would suggest putting that into your personal phone, keeping it. That way you've got it, uh, the contact. Now, when you contact uh, them, they will give you two things of information. First of all, they'll give you their first name only, and then usually a four or five digit code that is their personal code. They're not going to give you a last name. They'll only give you that code number. That is their operator number. That's who you spoke to. The second thing that's going to happen is they're going to then ask you a lot of information. They're going to want to know your name, your address, your phone number, how to be in, reach, in contact with you. Secondarily, they're going to want to know the relationship that you have to the child in question that you're reporting on. Uh, at that point in time, you just tell them you are a licensed professional counselor associate or an LPC if you have obtained that by then. And you can even tell them who you work for and how the relationship is that you have with the, the child. Um, they're, real, they're expecting these kinds of phone calls, so they're very familiar with our licensing. Uh, okay, so the third thing then is they're going to want the child's name, information, address, their date of birth, uh, the mother's name, the father's name, all the children that live in the household. They're going to want that information. So here's where your uh, psychosocial assessment comes in handy, knowing who's in the house, having phone numbers for mom and dad, having the address for mom and dad, very important. If the parents are divorced, you're going to want to be able to say, hey, mom and dad are divorced. They live in two different locations. Very important information. Uh, trust me, the caseworker that you give this to will love you if you have all that information ready to go before you call. So take a moment, write down on a piece of paper all of that information, and uh, just be ready for it because they're going to have a lot of questions for you. The last thing they're going to start doing then is asking you, what do you think is going on? What is your uh, rationale for calling? Uh, here again, you only have to have reasonable cause. You do not have to have a lot of investigation material. You just have to go say, I suspect this is what's happening, and here's why I suspect it. That's where you go back to those previous slides that we just covered, and they'll say, I saw this, I heard that, and this is why I believe it's happening. Now, the last thing they're going to give you is another set of numbers. This is a confirmation number, and it is oftentimes the actual uh, case number for that CPS case report. So you might receive a phone call from a CPS caseworker, and they'll have that case number, and they'll give you a call up, and they'll say, hi, this is so-and-so. I am a CPS caseworker. I am following up on this report. Are you the person who made the phone call? They'll verify that they're talking to the right person, and they'll probably have that report number to verify with you that that is accurate. Uh, they will want to call you. I've been contacted many times by CPS caseworkers that were getting ready to go to the uh, reportee's home that I had sent them to so they can do their follow-up. They'll want to Get, get in touch with you and just see if there's any other details that you may want to share. Other than that, your report is then accomplished and you need to document that. Okay, so at this point in time, you have made the report, you called CPS, you gave them all the information, they have given you a case number. In the hospital setting, you are going to want to put that case number and what you have done in the file of your client in your child's case. Um, also, that case, you want to talk to your supervisor. They may have other things that you have to do for that facility, for that agency. Um, I know that for some facilities, there was a secondary report that has to be filed that is not a part of the medical chart record. Uh, and so therefore, uh, it'd be an incident report you have to file. Uh, I know that several agencies do that in this region. Uh, for example, the MHMRA system that Texas has for mental health, mental retardation authorities, they have a reporting system 
in-house that they keep track of. So you have to make sure you're doing that as well for your agency. Uh, I want to point out, this is not just about children. Um, this is also pertaining to adults and senior citizens. So that phone number will have a division in it where they'll ask, is this for a child or an adult? And you can tell them. Also, I want to point out the online approach, the Texas Abuse Hotline. I've used that one as well. It's quite effective. It is online. In other words, you don't have to make a phone call. And the only thing about it that I personally do not like is you have to create an account. And you got to remember the password that you use for it. Um, it, for me personally, this is just a matter of personal preference. I prefer just to make the phone call. It's just a lot easier than doing it on the computer. Uh, but then again, I prefer the way things used to be done 20 years ago. It's just a lot simpler to me. If you're tech savvy and you prefer to do things online, then by all means you have the right to do that as well. Remember, uh, you have to get it done within 48 hours. Unless you're working for a company that requires 24, I would encourage you to stick to that 24 time frame, even though the state says 48 is acceptable. Okay. All right. We have covered how to report abuse, what abuse is, how to identify it when you see it, and sometimes it can be very deceptive looking. So. You don't have to dig, you don't have to investigate, but if you see something that seems really fishy or just out of the uh, norm, uh, put the pieces together and then make the call. Uh, your job is not to investigate, but if you spot something that's questionable, report it and allow others to do the investigating. Uh, there's always the possibility that your parents may be very, very upset with you, and you'll have to address that with your supervisor at your job site. Um, if that is a topic that you run into, uh, bring it up in our individual session or in group session while we're doing supervision, and we'll go into more detail at that point in time. For today, uh, welcome to supervision. This has been reporting abuse, and we've discussed it, I think, in fairly good detail. Uh, if you have any comments or uh, things you want to say, feel free to put that in the comments section. And we're going to wrap up for this week. Uh, if you are one of my LPC associates, I look forward to seeing you in group uh, or in our individual sessions throughout the week, uh, the month. But in any case, uh, this one's real important, guys. You want to go back and watch this one thoroughly. Write down that phone number. Put it in your phone. Uh, be prepared to make CPS reports. It is not scary. They're very agreeable uh, to working with us, uh, to taking the information. And because they know you're just doing your job. Uh, if you have reasonable cause to suspect, then you've got a reason to call. Until next time, take care, stay ethical, and do the right thing.